Japan, the land of the rising sun. We see its influence every day in our smartphones, cars, TV shows and music. In many regards, it's a global superpower, one not to be messed with. And it's also one of humanity's oldest cultures. Japan's history, stretching back thousands of years, is as interesting as it is bloody. Today, we'll take a trip down memory lane and explore the fascinating history of Japan. The first time a human set foot on the Japanese archipelago was some 32,000 years ago. Those people came from the continent and were of course hunter-gatherers. The few things that we know about them is that eventually they formed a common culture, we now call the Jomon culture, after their unique pottery. That pottery is possibly the oldest, making the Jomon people the first to ever create ceramics. Thousands of years later, a revolution occurred in these islands. Around the 4th century BC, a new crop arrived to Japan from the mainland, rice. New settlers from China and Korea came and interacted with the Jomon, creating the basis of the modern Japanese nation. The Yayoi, as we call them, brought agriculture and iron technology. To farm the land, you need farmers, so Japanese society radically changed. New landowners became the regional lords and began fighting each other for access to water and farmlands. It was said that a hundred kingdoms fought each other during those times. Slowly, those kingdoms unified under a single central government between the 3rd and the 6th century AD. Buddhism, Chinese elite culture and Chinese writing also arrived to Japan during those times. In 794 AD, Emperor Kanmu moved its capital to Heian-ko, modern-day Kyoto, marking the beginning of the Heian period, during which a distinct Japanese culture emerged. This period lasted until the 12th century, when Japan entered the feudal era, emperors lost their powers, and the samurai emerged as the new ruling class. In the 1100s, Japan was a refined, complex culture, a result of the imperial court's influence from Kyoto. But in the outer regions, far from Kyoto, disorder and anarchy were the rule of thumb. The daimyo, great landholders, richly rewarded their warriors, the samurais, feared and respected soldiers with special privileges and a special code of honor, Bushido. Two great families stood high above all, the Minamoto and the Taira. They were descendants of imperial princes sent out in the 9th century to impose imperial rule in the far reaches of the country. They gathered wealth, support and power, but of course they wanted more. The Genpei War started. The Minamoto and the Taira clans fought each other for supremacy between 1180 and 1185. Minamoto Yoritomo was victorious and the Taira were killed in battle, forced to commit suicide or executed. The emperor named Yoritomo the country's military dictator, the first shogun. The emperor was left without any real power and the era of the shogunate began. The domination of the shoguns stretched all the way to the 19th century. It transformed the samurai into the absolute superior military and social class. The samurai were tough warriors who disliked the decadent culture of the imperial court, so they became an incredible mixture of sophistication and savagery. The ideal warrior could compose poetry as well as cut off his enemy's head. In theory, they followed the strict code of honor. For instance, rather than facing defeat, they were supposed to perform a ritualistic suicide, seppuku, by disemboweling themselves, harakiri. The domination of men who dedicated their lives to war, of course, led to violence in a country that faced no external enemies. The only real outside threat during the Middle Ages was China, who, under the Mongol emperor Kublai Khan, tried to invade Japan in 1281. It was during that invasion that the Chinese fleet was dispersed by two major typhoons the Japanese called Kamikaze, or Divine Wind. But aside from this event, Japan faced no real outside threats, so the samurai only fought amongst each other. But the shoguns of Japan weren't always accepted. In 1331, Emperor Go Daigo wanted to restore imperial power and reinstate the emperor as the absolute ruler of Japan. He called upon all warriors to fight the shogun and defend the emperor. Many clans were willing to do this, but not for the emperor, but to take power themselves. A civil war began, the emperor was expelled from Kyoto and the new emperor was put in place. 
Different clans supported different emperors and the civil war stretched out for 60 years until Yoshimitsu Ashikaga made peace in 1392 and firmly re-established the shogunate. Yoshimitsu ushered in a golden age for Japanese culture, promoting arts, culture and sophistication. But in the far reaches of the empire, trouble emerged again as the brutal landlords, the daimyo, periodically staged civil war after civil war. Up until the 16th century, Japan remained a divided and unstable country. The last major battle between Japanese forces was during the Sekigahara battle in 1600. Tokugawa Ieyasu, the son of a daimyo, won and installed the Tokugawa shogunate. Japan was reunited. During this time, the country went through some major changes. Let's paint a picture first. You're in the 17th century. Imagine a great city with high stone walls, huge guard posts and great moats built around what was surely the greatest castle in the world. This city, full of artisans, merchants and workers, was the city of Edo, a city twice the size of the greatest European urban centers of the time. Today we know it as Tokyo. Its streets were full of members of all social classes enjoying a period of great peace, known as the Edo period. This was an era of peace like no other and it lasted for 250 years. Tokugawa established his military capital in this city while the emperor, who again had no political power, remained in Tokyo. In this era, Edo became the homeland of Japanese traditions and culture and even today residents of Tokyo are known as Edoko, children of Edo. So how did the shogun manage to do this? It wasn't easy. This piece depended on the original daimyo who controlled the provinces. The shogun had to cooperate with all the daimyo to maintain its power. It was a difficult alliance. The daimyo had to respect all of the shogun's decisions and in order to ensure this would happen, they would periodically send their wives and children to Edo. So basically blackmailing. In return, the daimyo had a lot of freedom and authority to rule their lands, including taxation and land leases. In the Edo period, Japan also went through a social engineering experiment. The people of Japan were classified as samurai, peasants, craftsmen or merchants. At the top remained the samurai, the only ones who were allowed to carry weapons. They were led by military commanders and worked as government officials, guards or policemen in service of either the shogun or the local daimyo. Together with the daimyo and the shogun, they formed the upper class of Japan. Of course, officially, above them were the emperor and its court. But the real change came in the second echelon. 80% of the Japanese nation were peasants and they were now considered to be inferior only to the samurai. Now, at least locally, peasants had much greater autonomy. They could elect their leader and form local councils. They paid their taxes in rice and gained the right to cultivate their leased lands. In exchange, they were obliged to tend to the farms of the local lands, thus they were practically unable to leave their villages. A lower class to peasants were the craftsmen, followed by merchants. But although they were the lowest social classes of Japan, they were the ones to put the urban economy into first gear. Their shops and products developed cities like Edo and Kyoto and they became wealthier. This new money compensated their status as lower classes. This new social structure was very strict and rigid and defined all aspects of life, including clothing, social etiquette and even tea drinking. Still, the Edo period was the moment Japanese culture rebirthed and flourished. Zen gardens, the tea ceremony, haiku poetry, no theater, ukiyo-e paintings that later influenced Van Gogh and Jean Monnet all came from this era. Despite the fact that Japan flourished during the Tokugawa shogunate, there were some drawbacks. During the Edo period, all foreign influences were discouraged. From 1635 onward, Japanese citizens were not allowed to leave the country. Those who were already outside would face death if they ever returned. Christianity was abolished and all missionaries and foreign merchants were kicked out. For 265 years, Japan abided by the Sakoku policies or chained country. However, at the beginning of the 19th century, Japan went through famines, earthquakes and political upheavals that led to thousands of deaths. This closed-door policy also increased the gap between rich and poor and at the same time foreign ships began to appear on the shores of Japan. 
It was time for another change, one that would lift Japan out of feudalism and place it into the modern era. In 1853, Commodore Matthew Perry of the US Navy steamed into the Bay of Edo with four warships. He demanded that Japan open to trade with the West, all the while demonstrating the superior power of his ships. The following year, he returned with eight ships and forced the Shogun to sign the Treaty of Peace and Amity, thus establishing formal diplomatic relations. The United Kingdom, France, Russia and the Netherlands followed. Japan's isolationist policies were over, and the country was once again open to the world. At the same time, it lost control over its customs, taxes and duties, plus many Japanese weren't pleased with this open-door policy considering the treaties with the Western powers as unfair and humiliating. A series of revolts followed as the ruling class knew how far behind Japanese technology was and were fearing Western colonization. As a result, in 1868, after 700 years of shogunate rule in Japan, Emperor Meiji regained its political powers, an event known as the Meiji Restoration. He moved his residence from Kyoto to Edo and renamed it Tokyo, or the Eastern Capital. After a long time, Japan was once again ruled by a civilian government. The new regime wanted to industrialize the country and adopt Western ideas and production methods. The slogans of the time were Oitsuke Oikose and Fukoku Kyohei, catch up and overtake and enrich the country, strengthen the military. Enormous social changes occurred. The old social classes were changed into nobility, descendants of the samurai and common folks. The old daimyo were replaced with prefectures. Enlistment in the army was extended to all men, not just the nobility. The University of Tokyo was opened with foreign professors. And a new national bank was created that established a standardized currency, the yen. Under Emperor Meiji, the old Japan perished and the new modern country was born. Perhaps the greatest change in Japanese society came with mobility. In 1872, the first railway between Tokyo and Yokohama was opened. In the next 15 years, another 1600 kilometers of railways were constructed. This changed Japanese society from its foundation. Suburbs grew, villages were now moving into cities, and factories popped up everywhere. The era of commuters began. At the same time, a new feeling of national pride and Japanese identity sprung up. Japan was not only trying to catch up with the rest of the world, they had bigger ambitions and wanted to be taken seriously. The new government believed that Japan had to acquire its own colonies to compete with the Western colonial powers. In 1894, this ambition led to a clash between Japanese and Chinese troops in Korea. The First Sino-Japanese War broke out. The Chinese fleet was destroyed, Port Arthur in Manchuria was conquered, as well as the port of Wei Highway. After six months of unbroken Japanese successes, China was forced to sign the Treaty of Shimonoseki. China relinquished all claims in Korea, gave some exploitation rights in Manchuria, and ceded Taiwan to Japan. This was the first step in Japan's plan to become a global power. Russia also had interests in Manchuria, which eventually led to another war in 1904. Once again, Japan won. Its interests in Korea were recognized and the Liaodong Peninsula of Manchuria was ceded to them. Korea was firmly under Japanese control without much protest from the international community. Japan was now taken seriously. In just half a century, they transformed themselves from a backwards obscure country into a global superpower. During World War I, Japan consolidated its position as a great power. They expanded their influence in China and seized German colonies in the Pacific and East Asia. During those years, its industrial output exploded fivefold, but after the war ended, prices fell and an economic recession began. The gap between rich and poor once again grew, and this time many blamed the Western ideas Japan so eagerly adopted. Despite its new position, Japan still felt it wasn't respected enough. They were founding members of the League of Nations, created to promote diplomacy and avoid military conflict. Japan proposed a clause of racial equality in the League's charter, which was rejected. Then came the Washington Naval Treaty in 1922, which limited the number of naval warships Japan could possess. Try as they might, Japanese authorities didn't manage to be on equal footing with Western powers. Soon, their frustration with the West turned into anger and disgust. 
the extraordinarily ambitious Japanese Empire would soon come in conflict with the very powers it once modeled itself on. But that part of the story merits its own episode. I hope this video was interesting enough to have inspired you to look into it further on your own. If you liked it, leave a like and subscribe. You can leave your comments downstairs and you can also check out my Patreon page if you want to support me. The link is in the description. I do hope to see you next time. Bye.